so that we can share this morning in worship. Let's stand together and sing about the first Noel.
are called the what? Children of God. And behold, that is what we are. I love this last song. We can sing all about what Christmas is and what Jesus has done, but it comes down to what He has changed your life, how He has made you different. Who you say I am is one of those songs that says, I will live as a child of God. Let's sing this together.
your only son. And may we today worship you in wisdom, truth, and just excitement in knowing who and whose we are. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, wave to one another, would you please? Good to see everybody here. Hey, I've got a present for you today. And what I do, what I, what I do with my lighter. It's on the bench. It's on the bench. I actually remember to do this. And not only that, I'll tell you what, I am I brought in a guest artist today that uh, has been missing playing the piano. So I paid you money today to come play right here. I didn't pay her anything, but she gets to go home with me. That's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> she may not play a bit. <laughs> but as we light her hand again, yeah, as I we light her hand again, I remember this week. Let's listen to this great piece. <laughs>
not often that I'm at a loss for words, but I miss that part of our Sunday service. Mm -hmm. Every single week, I mean, I never would do it, but she would make me cry. <laughs> Every single week. And he's done it again this week, too. Amen. We are so blessed to have this lady on the piano. Lord, I've been in churches where, bless their heart, they try. <laughs> this lady, God has blessed her with real talent. We are very fortunate to have this lady on the piano. Amen. I've said it repeated every time I've gone to a church to, uh, to preach for a beautiful call. I always say, uh, can my wife sing something, play something? That, that, that always helps a lot. Well, thank you for that. And we will be getting back to normal in a few months. I think the end is in sight. And let's continue to, to pray to that end. Also, couple of changes. We're going to change in the next couple of weeks, including today and next week, out of Acts. We're going to take a Christmas tour a little bit. And next week, we don't have a choir, we don't have children, and we're not going to do a Christmas Eve service this year because of all the things that are going on. However, next Sunday, we're going to try to make it as special as we can. So we're going to mix in some of the uh, some kids, some families, Brenda's going to play. Uh, I'm not going to preach nearly as long. I knew that would get an amen. And, uh, no, it's true. I won't. And we will have a Christmas service next Sunday morning. We'll be singing a lot more of the Christmas carols and things that you'll enjoy. So uh, be here next week for that as we uh, share in that as well. Christmas in preaching since you're not you're not preaching, you don't recognize it, but it's it gets difficult because preaching about Christmas is something you expect every year. And I've been doing it for 35 years. It's hard to get original after a while. And so I have to get uh, my holy imagination has to kind of get rolling a little bit. And that's what I've done this morning. One of the problems that I think we have with Christmas and with Christianity in general is that we know a lot of stuff and we tend to box up that stuff that we know and we know it well we put it on a shelf and we got it and if we don't look into it very deeply because we know it and as a result of knowing the stuff that we know we tend to lose our wonder that of the stuff that's in the box you know what i'm talking about Instead of being like a kid who just cannot wait to see what's in the box, we know all the contents, and it doesn't really get to us that much. So, what I want to do today is use a box of information found in 1 Peter, and you can turn to it if you want to. I'm going to use it on the board, and I'm going to look at a number of scriptures this morning. But in chapter 1, is a, is a treasure trove box of great doctrinal truth about what God has done. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights or you've watched on Wednesday nights, this passage, I think, took me about three or four weeks to get through. I won't do it this morning. It's so chock full of great truth. And we're going to look at that box, but what I'm going to do in using my holy imagination is look at the very last phrase that has piqued my imagination and my thoughts for many years. I've just never done much with it. So this morning I'm going to play with it a little bit uh, in front of you. Chapter 1, 1 Peter, verse 5. It's interesting to know before I read that, that Peter is writing to a people under great stress, great anxiety. Theirs was based upon their faith, Ours may be based upon other things like our pandemic that we're going through. But in the stress, Peter says, take out that box. Take out that box that you know well. I want you to get the lid off of it. I want you to look at it closely. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now you rejoice in this. Even though for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. Why? 
so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which, though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revel revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ <clears throat> and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And here's the phrase we're going to steal away and kind of play with. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. The contents of that box, I hope as I read carefully through them, that some of them kind of spill out a little bit more than what they used to. I want you to look at the contents of the box and, and, and it and at least to, to glory and praise to Jesus Christ who has come, announced to you in his birth and gone to the cross and sacrificed on your behalf. Mm. But I want to look at that last phrase because it says that there's angels that are longing to know more. They're wanting to catch a glimpse of what's going on. It's the angels that are looking in the box and saying, wow, this is amazing. Tell us more. We want to understand even further. The angels, created beings, those mysterious beings that have a purpose in God's plan, have existed before the creation of this world, and then it's been observing all things at all times. So what I was using in my holy imagination, I was thinking about a group of angels that were taking a coffee break in heaven. Now we know that it can't be heaven unless there's coffee there. So we've got that one covered. But they're taking a coffee break in heaven. And of course you know angels, they're not God. They don't have all wisdom all knowledge. They do not know what is going to happen or why it's going to happen. They are simply observing as it happens. And so here they are in the break room, around the coffee pot, and they're talking, as you would at work, about what's going on at work. What's happening? Why are they doing what they're doing? What's going on these days? So, I want us to use our imagination this morning. Be a child with me for a little while. And here's some of the questions that these angels that are longing to catch a glimpse at the glory and majesty of God and what he's doing on the benefit, for the benefit of humanity. And listen to a couple of questions that they might have for one another. First question might be this. On the day where God spoke everything into existence is why is God doing this creation thing in the first place? And especially as they looked at Adam and Eve, why these people? Now let me tell you why God didn't create. God didn't create because he was lonely. Man, that's been a poetic thing that God was lonely and he needed humanity to feel somewhat at home with no. And this is a very important doctrine. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. Trinity. God the Father. Help me out now. God the Father. Father. God the Son. God the Holy That's Spirit. right. We call that the Trinity. And how long has the Trinity existed? Forever. That 
mind before the world was ever created, before God spoke it into existence, God knew what perfect love, perfect harmony, the perfect relationship was all about. He didn't create the world in order to figure out what love was about because God is love. Okay, so you guys are catching on now. Alright, that's good. Also, he didn't need an audience. He didn't need an audience for someone to say, man, that was good, God, because there are no needs in the life of God. If there's a need in the life of God, then one thing we say, he ain't God. Because God is completely, totally self-sufficient. He did not create us so that we would say, way to go, God, we praise him. No, he doesn't need that. He also doesn't need, want to be a, a powerful, all-consuming being that has kind of got us like a marionette and moving us around. Not at all. In fact, Hosea 11 9 says this, I will not vent the full fury of my anger. This is talking to Israel. I will not turn my back or turn back to destroy Ephraim. That is what he says, for I am God and not what? I'm not man. I'm the holy one among you. I will not come in rage. Here is God who is not on the level of humanity. He is far beyond that in a way that we can't even conceive of it. And when God creates, He creates out of nothing other than His desire to create us. And then, as the angels are watching, Adam and Eve have said, Okay, this, this may be a good idea. Let's walk. What? They're reaching for the wrong fruit. Don't they know? And boom, they take a big bite and they see the fall. And you got it. And so that question might be, all right, why doesn't God just start over again? Why doesn't God just do the whole thing over again? Interesting to note that the angels, some of them had already fallen, right? How do we know that? Lucifer is the one who was in the garden, and he was an angel of the morning, beautiful angel. So there was already angels, and already angels that had fallen, and guess what? Those angels that have fallen have no hope. There's no hope. There's no redemption for angels. Once they're fallen, they're fallen. But here is God speaking to fallen humanity. He says, by the way, Satan, there is coming one that will crush your head. And God already, these angels have overlooked us. He's talking about redemption. That's an amazing thing. I don't get that. So why did God create us? Well, we know that God is love. And that kind of eternal, bottomless, complete love leads to creation. And in His all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful ways, God, I get this, God chooses to tie Himself to his creation. I love what I heard my pastor say. He said, to all you men, if your wives come up and say, why do you love me? Don't say, I love you because you're cooking. Because the next meal, they may burn it. Don't say, I love you because you're beautiful. What happens when they, I hate to say it, but they're not as beautiful as they used to be. I love you because you're rich. <laughs> what if they lose all their money? You see, he says, if your wife comes up and says, why do I love you? You just say, I love you because I love you. And that's what God does. I love you because I've chosen to love you. Now, I get this. I get this well. When you love, it will cost you. Love brings sacrifice. Great love brings great sacrifice. And eternal love requires eternal sacrifice. Look at what God says. I have loved you with and what? Everlasting love. I 
continue to extend faithful love to you. And he shows that in Revelation. And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast, those, they are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made, that before the world was ever made and called into existence, God in his mind, in his heart, in his existence, had already sacrificed the Son on our behalf. And then he calls us into creation. Can you believe that? You don't wonder why those angels around that coffee bottle were shaking, scratching their heads. This doesn't make a lot of sense. That is the grace of God. I hope it smacks you in the face today and says, this is how I have loved you. Well, there's some more questions, though. As they go on through the centuries, they say, okay, all right, we, we got, there's, there's going to be something that's going to crush the head of Satan. I got it. But why do you begin the story of redeeming love with Abraham? Why start with Abraham? I mean, after all, he is, he doesn't even live in the land, right? He is a he's a foreigner. He's someone outside. He's an idolater. He's wealthy. Okay, we get that, the angels say, but he's not powerful. There is no good reason why he should choose Abraham. In fact, one of the angels probably said, Now don't tell God this. But if it were up to me. I would have chosen Pharaoh because he was the most powerful man on the earth. Zechariah set those angels straight when he said, not by strength or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of angel armies. See, God says, I I'm not going to look at what you think is going to be powerful. I'm going to do it through something that you would never imagine. But it gets even worse. When you look at Abraham, Abraham, not, it's not bad. I mean, right? He's a man of great integrity, uh, of great strength. Uh, he has great faith. You know, he, he trusts God. Even though he said, man, I'll, I'll never have children, but I'm trusting you, God. And he has a child. And, and he believes in it. But then his son Isaac is, he's a little wishy-washy. And boy, you come down to Jacob, and Jacob is a deceiver. Then you go on a little bit further, and you find his, his children, Abraham's great-grandkids, his family turns upon Joseph, and they're ready to kill him. They throw him into slavery. And by the way, Judah, one of those 12 sons of Jacob, he's chosen to be the one through whom the line of Jesus would come. Now, he wasn't the oldest. He was the chosen of God. These angels say, wait a second. Hey, you know the story of Joseph? Or of, of, of Judah, rather? <clears throat> Judah had a son who died. And he was married to Tamar. He's supposed to get another of his sons to marry Tamar. And he doesn't do it. And so Tamar fools him. Stay, sits on the roadside as a prostitute, and Judah, being a wonderfully religious man, has a relationship with her. She is pregnant by her father-in-law, and out of Tamar comes the line of Jesus Christ. Whoa! But it gets worse, because in the line is also a lady by the name of Rahab who is a prostitute in a foreign land. But it gets even more interesting. You have Ruth, who is somebody who was out of the, the people of Moab. And then it gets even more crazy. You have Bathsheba, who is someone who caused adultery in the life of King David. You can imagine why those angels say, this didn't make a whole lot of sense. This is not making a lot of sense. If I were going to write it, this is not the way that I would write it. God speaks to Deuteronomy and says, The Lord, get this phrase, get it on your heart today. 
The Lord had said on you and his heart on you and chose you. He said his heart on you and chose you. Not because you were numerous, then more numerous than all the peoples. For you the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors. He brought you out of the strong hand and redeemed you from the place of slavery, from the power of, of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The very one that one angel might have chosen is the one that he says, no, 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 he's going to lose. Because God, not because they were wonderful people, but because God had a wonderful plan. Amen. By the way, he loved you not because you're wonderful people. He loved you because of the grace that's in his life. Well, it goes on, and so they're moving along. Okay, we got a lot of kids, and they're getting out there, and they finally get through the Red Sea and all that stuff. And, and so they get to the, finally to David. And the next question comes up, why didn't they use David to fulfill his promise? Why didn't King David be the one to fulfill? You can imagine the angels. They're around the coffee pot, and they're saying, man, this is exciting. I can see how God's going to bring this together now. There, here's David, this little shepherd kid. Okay, he looks weak, and God's going to use him. That's great. He stands forth alive. He's got great faith. That's wonderful. He's got integrity, and, and he's a king now. And look, he's leading great armies, and they're defeating all the enemies. He's causing a nation to rise out of it. Jerusalem is going to be a, a great capital. It's, this is great. This is wonderful. God comes into the angel meeting and says, don't get too excited, God. This is not done yet. And leaves. I, 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 don't, I don't get this. Isn't David? I mean, even, even Scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. Why not use David? For this reason. David truly was a man after God's own heart. But Jesus was a man who had God's heart. Amen. Ooh, there's a big difference there. Look what Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of His nature, sustaining all things by His powerful word. After making purification for sins, that means crucifixion on the cross, resurrection from the dead, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Those angels weren't getting it. They said, man, look at this powerful king. But they didn't understand that God's plan was not a military plan, nor a national plan, nor a political fix. It was a heart fix. You could create a great and mighty leader and a powerful political nation but within years, as it happened in Israel, it will collapse. Unless the heart is changed, nothing is changed. By the Old Testament's end, the Jews were clamoring for a Messiah, someone to lead them on the throne of David, to, to take over and rule and reign and become powerful and, and important one more time. And after 400 years of silence, the angels are in the coffee room again, and they're saying, we've heard something. It's going to happen now. And then they see what happens. And the next question that they, that they look at each other and say, why does God use a teenage virgin to bring about the Messiah? Who would have thunk it? This makes no sense. Why in the world would God use the most powerless of the powerless? As far as we know, her station in life was at the bottom. Financially, economically, socially, in every way, she was a nobody. She was also a child, just a teenager, 14, 15 at the most. And then she's a virgin that if, if she becomes pregnant, it's going to be like a shame within that honor shame uh, 
area that they lived in, time that they lived in, it would have been an incredible shame upon her life. So why in the world? Wow, those angels said, we, we, we've been trying to fall over this time. I don't think I'm going to get this one. So we're going to help them a little bit. Why does God use a teenage virgin to bring out the sign? Well, one is to fulfill Scripture. I think that's very important. Do you know, you realize, and I've not done it, but I've just, I've read those who have taken the time. There's somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 prophecies about Messiah in the Old Testament. 400. I mean, it's a bunch. <clears throat> but, let me, let me just boggle your mind a little bit further. You ready to boggle a little bit? Some of you are born boggle. Let me boggle a little bit more. Mathematics and astronomy professor Peter Stoner tried to explain what this, this means, the odds of prophecies coming true. Now, I said there's about 400 of them, but if there was only eight, only eight, just take eight out of the Old Testament about the Messiah, the odds of those eight coming true hundreds of years later is about 1 in 10 to the 17th power. That means 1 with 17 zeros behind. Now, to give you a sense of that, I love this illustration. It'd be the equivalent of covering the whole state of Texas. You got it? The whole state of Texas with silver dollars two feet deep and then expecting a blindfolded man to walk across the state and on the very first try, pick out one of those silver dollars that you had marked particularly. That's the, uh, the odds it would be for eight scriptures to be fulfilled. And there's 400 of them. So one of the reasons why we see this unusual experience of a, a teenage virgin bringing forth a Messiah is so that scripture can be fulfilled, prophecy can be fulfilled. But also, God does the impossible. Amen. God loves doing the impossible. <clears throat> he is not dependent upon man. Now, notice God doesn't do this like, poof, there you go. He uses biology, but he uses it in a unique manner. And I came up with one. You can talk to me later. I don't know if it's good or not. I didn't see it anywhere, but it just occurred to me. Sometimes I think deep thoughts, Jim. It's hard to believe. But here's, here's my thought. You know that as a young lady, she would ovulate. And so there's an egg each month. And that egg, unless there is sperm to go along with it, is of no value in that century in particular. Interesting. The way that the scripture talks about the conception of Jesus in this teenage young lady is that the Holy Spirit came upon him. And it started my mind thinking, the Holy Spirit, the, the word for Holy Spirit is pneuma, which we get the word pneumonia from, which means breath. And guess what? The old word in Old Testament, the Hebrew word in Old Testament is ruach, and it means breath. And it brought to my mind Adam, made out of dirt, lifeless and unusual, uh, un un help helpless, until the breath of God came upon that Adam, and he became a living man, and this egg, the breath of God comes on this egg, and it becomes a living man, and becomes God-man. God-man. I don't know if it has any value to it. You can take it home play with it. But then I also think one other thing. Why, why does God use this Jewish teenage virgin to bring forth Messiah? It's because of the Jews' uniqueness. 
They're unlike anyone, get this, unlike any other religion in the entire world at that time. If you went anywhere else, Greece, Rome, India, anywhere, anywhere, and you would say, I am a God man. They would say, okay, this is cool. You're a God man. I like that. But anyone that would come to the Jews and would say, I'm a God man, they would say, no, you're not. Because there is only one true God, and God would never become a man. And God takes the most unusual circumstance, the most impossible circumstance, and he brings forth a God man in the presence of people who couldn't possibly ever worship him. And at his death and resurrection, guess who worships Jesus immediately? The Jews. God makes it absolutely impossible. Listen. If I were going to, if I were going to write and try to create a new religion, if I were going to start a new movement, I wouldn't have put in there that he was born of a virgin and then he died on the cross and rose from the dead. I just wouldn't do it because it doesn't make any sense. So if you're going to start something, just kind of leave this out. But I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing to bring to nothing. What is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who became wisdom from God for us. Our righteousness, sanctification and redemption. In order that as it is written. Let the one who boasts. Boast in the Lord, for he alone is the one who has created this crazy thing. But there's one more thing. That the angels around the comic book must have said, I simply don't get this. I, I look into it, I, I want to know more, I simply don't get it. That is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Can you imagine the angels who love Jesus? This is God in the flesh. They worship Jesus. They observe the life of Jesus. They see how he does great miraculous things, walks in the water, heals the deaf and the blind. And then, at the end of his life, faces the anger of the crowd, the spitting, the beating, the ultimate climb of the Calvary, the outrage the angels must have over the darling of heaven that was crucified. Why did he have to die? Well, let me, let me go the other way. And that is why he had to live. You see, when, when we look at the death of Jesus, that's so important. Obviously, he dies as a substitute for us on the cross. So that great sacrifice that we talked about with eternal love comes eternal sacrifice. He takes our place. He takes our sin. But never forget that he lived a righteous life. Why did he live a righteous life? So when he dies, he takes our sin, but he gives us his righteous life. He lived a life we could not live. He died the death we could not die. It's amazing to the angels. It's amazing to me that when God looks at us, he looks at the life of Jesus and he said, that's my child. That's who I am. Oh, that I would live that way each day with the joy and the expectancy of what God can do in my life. Great verse. 2 Corinthians 5.21 If you do not memorize this when you should. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the great exchange on the cross. It's only through dying that death could be Killed. He absorbed all the sin in the world, and the result was the penalty of death could not hold him in the grave. And we stand forgiven. But the righteousness, righteousness that we receive from Jesus 
life belongs, brings us into the family of God as loved and as righteous as He is. Get this, on the cross, Jesus takes what we deserve and He gives to us what He deserves. And the angels were in all. So why do the angels rejoice? Well, as they long to look into the grace and majesty of God, they have seen the scope of God's grace and love, and they are amazed. On the night of his birth, the angels proclaimed in the heavens, Unto you is born this day a Savior, which is Christ, the Lord. And in those few words, they give to us the entire gospel. The Savior, Jesus, Joshua, means God, Yahweh, saves. Christ, he is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. Lord, he is God, Emmanuel, God with us, tabernacle in the flesh. It's interesting. There are only, well, there are more, but there are three significant places in Scripture where the angels are seen to be rejoicing and I think singing. Job 38, 7 says they sang at creation. In the Gospels, they sang at the birth of Jesus. And in Revelation 5, they sing at the presentation of the Lamb at the last days in heaven. Now, let me close with this. This is shouting around. Paul says, Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Silence. No one in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look at it. John says, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he's able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And then I saw one like a slaughter, not lion, but lamb. Standing in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures and among the elders, and his seven horns, the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, set on the all the earth. He went and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. You are worthy. To take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slaughtered. You purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom of priests to our God and they will reign on earth. And then I looked. No coffee break now. I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. And also the living creatures and the elders and their number was countless thousands plus thousands and thousands. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered and received power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth and in the sea, and everything in them say blessing and honor and glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down. Not a soul, not an angel in the, in, the, in the break room at that moment they were out celebrating the slaughtered lamb, the lion of Judah, the salvation of saints, the redemption of mankind. 
as we face Christmas in these odd times. Take the box off the wall, stuff that you know, open it up, and just be surprised at the grace, mercy, love, power of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Amen. I'm going to ask my brother Mary to come to the piano. We're going to close with a song. Because I think we should sing a song with the angels this morning. Angels, we have heard on high. How many of you sound angelic this morning? It doesn't matter. You're going to sound angelic as you sing this together. Let's stand together, shall we? We'll close our time together, joining the angels as they sing Gloria in excel and Chelsea's Dale, Glory to God in the Highest.